Note that when I squeeze this O-ring with pliers and then release it, the O-ring instantly springs back to its original shape. But when I do the same with an O-ring that's been immersed in ice water for a few minutes, its rebound is much slower. During the STS-51C launch, this loss of resilience slowed the sealing process, allowing hot propellant gases to blow past the primary O-ring for such an extended period that a substantial portion of the O-ring was burned away. Again, the secondary O-ring had prevented a disaster, but the margin between success and failure had been frighteningly slim. In retrospect, the O-ring distress observed after STS-51C should have provoked a more decisive response by both Thiokol and NASA. It didn't because the low temperature experienced during this launch was viewed as a unique one-off event. When the next mission, STS-51D Discovery, launched at 67 degrees and experienced no blow-by whatsoever, everyone breathed a collective sigh of relief and almost everyone stopped worrying about blow-by. However, a small group of Thiokol engineers remained extremely concerned. Led by an engineer named Roger Beaujolais, Thiokol's most knowledgeable O-ring expert, this group continued working diligently to understand and address these persistent O-ring issues. Their concern was warranted. On the next flight, STS-51B Challenger, a primary O-ring failed to seal, and for the first time ever, its associated secondary O-ring experienced significant erosion. Beaujolais immediately wrote a memo to his boss warning that the situation demanded immediate action to prevent what he called a catastrophe of the highest order. Fiacol responded by establishing an internal O-ring task force to conduct additional testing and ultimately to develop and implement a modified field joint design. Although this new design had great promise, it was disapproved by NASA in September 1985 because of its cost. And even if it had been approved, it couldn't possibly have been implemented prior to the STS-51L Challenger mission. And that brings us back to January 27, 1986, the eve of the ill-fated launch. When Thiokol's engineers learned that the temperature at Kennedy Space Center would fall to 18 degrees Fahrenheit that night and would only climb to 28 degrees by launch time, they immediately concluded that the launch had to be postponed. They notified their colleague, Alan McDonald, Thiokol's on-site representative at Kennedy Space Center, and McDonald set up a conference call in which the Thiokol engineers could present their recommendation to the NASA program managers from Marshall Space Flight Center, the NASA organization with management responsibility for the SRB program. The call began at 8.45 p.m. The key participants from Marshall were Stan Reinartz and Larry Malloy, who were both stationed at Kennedy for the launch, and George Hardy, who called in from Marshall's headquarters in Huntsville, Alabama. Participants from the Morton Thiokol plant in Utah were engineers, Roger Beaujolais, Arnie Thompson, and 11 other members of the engineering staff, their boss, Bob Lund, vice president for engineering, and three other corporate vice presidents, Joe Kilminster, Cal Wiggins, and Jerry Mason. Thiokol's Alan McDonald also joined the call from Kennedy Space Center. The Thiokol engineers, Roger Beaujolais and Arnie Thompson, began with a presentation summarizing the long, troubled history of SRB O-ring problems, supplemented by recent test data showing the adverse effect of cold temperatures on O-ring resilience. They emphasized that one year earlier, STS-51C had experienced severe O-ring distress at 53 degrees, and noted that the next day's launch temperature would be 25 degrees lower. 
dangerously outside of Thiokol's experience base. Lund, the senior Thiokol engineer, then concluded the presentation with Thiokol's recommendation that the launch of STS-51L should be delayed until the O-ring temperature reached 53 degrees. Although this recommendation was entirely reasonable, it provoked an unexpectedly harsh reaction from NASA. Larry Malloy angrily announced that he couldn't accept Thiokol's rationale. And then he added, my God, Thiokol, when do you want me to launch? Next April? George Hardy said he was appalled by the recommendation, and Stan Reinhardt argued that it was inconsistent with the SRB's design specifications, which required an operating range of 40 to 90 degrees. Malloy then pointedly asked Joe Kilminster, a Thiokol manager, for his recommendation. When Kilminster supported his engineer's position, Malloy again criticized their rationale, claiming that the data were inconclusive and therefore ought not be used as the basis for postponing a launch. Reinhardt's then demanded a response from Kilminster, who requested a five-minute offline caucus to discuss the issue with the Thiokol team in private. This five-minute caucus lasted over half an hour. Jerry Mason, the senior Thiokol manager in the room, opened the discussion by announcing, we need to make a management decision. The engineers, Beaujolais and Thompson, pleaded with their vice presidents to support postponement, but only received cold stares in response. Mason then asked the other three VPs if they were willing to fly. Cal Wiggins and Joe Kilminster said yes, but Bob Lund remained silent. Bob, said Mason, it's time for you to take off your engineer hat and put on your management hat. At this, Lund's resolve crumbled and he agreed to support the launch. His rank and file engineers remained unanimous in their opposition, but their concerns were ignored. The teleconference then resumed and Kilminster delivered the verdict. We've reassessed the data and concluded that the temperature effects are inconclusive. Therefore, he said, Morton Thiokol recommended going ahead with the launch. But this rationale made no sense. If the data were inconclusive, then the effects of low temperature were uncertain, and this uncertainty should have dictated a postponement rather than a launch. But having received the answer they were looking for, the NASA team approved the decision with no further discussion. Hardy then demanded that Thiokol put their recommendation in writing, an unprecedented request that was not part of NASA's standard launch approval process, seemed to suggest that Hardy recognized the risk inherent in this decision. Alan McDonald was stunned by his company's reversal. Because he was at Kennedy, he had no idea what had transpired in the offline caucus but he remained convinced that the launch should be postponed, and he argued vociferously with Malloy and Reinhardt to that end. As Thiokol's senior on-site representative, McDonald would have been the appropriate official to sign the launch recommendation, but he flatly refused to do so. Back in Utah, Kilminster had no such reservations. He faxed the signed document to NASA, and the fate of Challenger was sealed. What was going on here? Well, McDonald would later testify that NASA's conduct during this fateful teleconference was totally out of character. In all previous launch decisions, NASA would routinely challenge a contractor's recommendation to launch if there were unresolved technical issues. But NASA had never previously challenged a contractor's recommendation not to launch. Evidently, Malloy, Reinhardt, and Hardy were feeling pressure to maintain NASA's ambitious launch schedule and were becoming increasingly frustrated with the repeated postponements. There's also some evidence that Marshall Space Flight Center was suffering from a dysfunctional organizational climate in which senior management had come to view no-fly recommendations as admissions of failure. 
But why did Thiokol's senior managers succumb to NASA's pressure? Well, simply put, it was a business decision. NASA was Thiokol's most important customer. Yet at that moment, the company's lucrative business with NASA was in jeopardy. Several months earlier, Thiokol had negotiated a billion-dollar sole source contract to supply 66 solid rocket motors for future launches. However, just days prior to the Challenger launch, NASA had inexplicably refused to sign this contract and then announced that Thiokol's competitors would be invited to bid on future contracts. Thiokol had just made huge capital investments to expand its production facilities in support of this new contract, so its loss would have been devastating. Faced with such a severe blow to their business, Thiokol management had decided that the customer is always right, despite all evidence to the contrary. The following morning, Roger Beaujolais and his colleagues were filled with dread as they watched the launch on TV. They expected that a field joint failure would cause the vehicle to explode on the launch pad. So when the shuttle cleared the pad, they were ecstatic, but their joy was short-lived. No one saw it at the time, but films of the launch would later reveal puffs of black smoke emerging from the aft field joint on the right-hand SRB within one second after ignition. We now know that both O-rings in this joint had failed to seal and were being incinerated by hot propellant gas streaming through the joint. This failure should have caused an immediate explosion, just as the engineers expected. But when the hot gas came into contact with the cold steel of the field joint, molten aluminum oxide in the gas solidified and temporarily sealed the joint. This fortuitous event almost saved the Challenger, but at T plus 59 seconds, high altitude aerodynamic loads on the vehicle apparently caused this fragile aluminum oxide seal to fracture. At that instant, a tracking camera captured a plume of flame emerging from the SRB's aft field joint. The plume grew quickly, and at T plus 72 seconds, it severed a strut that connected the booster to the external tank, causing the SRB to pivot outward and collide with the tank. One second later, a structural failure of the tank triggered a massive explosion. To those of us who were watching the launch on TV, this was the first indication that the flight was anything but normal. The explosion sent the orbiter veering violently away from the planned trajectory, and the resulting aerodynamic forces broke Challenger apart in midair. The well-protected crew compartment remained largely intact until it hit the water at 200 miles per hour. That evening, President Reagan gave a somber address from the Oval Office, concluding with a touching remembrance of the seven Challenger astronauts. We will never forget them, nor, nor the last time, time we saw them. This morning, as they prepared for their journey and waved goodbye, and slipped the surly bonds of Earth to touch the face of God. Thank you. Reagan immediately established a presidential commission to investigate the failure. The commission's work was initially hampered by NASA Marshall and Morton Thiokol managers, who apparently conspired to withhold the truth about Thiokol's initial recommendation not to launch. Fortunately, Alan McDonald, himself a senior Thiokol manager, refused to play along. During the commission's second hearing, when it became clear that NASA wasn't even going to mention the pre-launch teleconference, McDonald interrupted the proceedings and exposed the truth. This courageous action opened the door to subsequent testimony by Roger Beaujolais and the other Thiokol engineers, without whom the commission could never have achieved its most important findings. First, that the Challenger disaster was caused by an SRB O-ring failure resulting from fundamental flaws in the field joint design. Second, that the low temperature at launch time contributed substantially to the failure. And third, that NASA's organizational culture and decision-making processes were deeply flawed and had also contributed to the failure.
By the way, one of the presidential commission members, Nobel laureate physicist Richard Feynman, will be forever remembered for performing this O-ring resilience demonstration during a televised hearing of the commission. Evidently, Feynman loved demos almost as much as I do. In the aftermath of the Challenger accident, NASA's entire shuttle fleet was grounded for nearly three years. Alan McDonald led a Morton Thiokol team that redesigned the SRB with robust triple O-ring joints that enabled the shuttle program to resume, and NASA implemented improvements to its decision-making processes. Unfortunately, the latter reforms proved to be fleeting as a similarly flawed decision led to the loss of the shuttle Columbia during re-entry on February 1st, 2003. Although the Challenger disaster involved a significant engineering design error, its most fundamental cause was a colossal failure of organizational decision-making. Evidently, NASA's long string of successful launches had engendered a growing sense of complacency among key decision makers. This complacency led first to overly ambitious goals. And then over time, the fact that previous O-ring problems hadn't caused the mission failure became the implicit justification for accepting ever greater levels of risk. As Richard Feynman astutely observed, when playing Russian roulette, the fact that the first shot got off safely is little comfort for the next. Members of my profession are fond of characterizing the Challenger disaster as a classic conflict between engineers and managers. According to this narrative, the catastrophe happened because virtuous engineers were overruled by unscrupulous managers. Jerry Mason's infamous demand that Bob Lund should take off his engineer hat and put on his management hat has dramatically reinforced this self-serving narrative. But the reality is not so clear cut. When we engineers tell the Challenger story, we usually fail to mention that all the so-called managers, Jerry Mason, Cal Wiggins, Joe Kilminster, Bob Lund, Larry Malloy, Stan Reinartz and George Hardy were also engineers. All were educated as engineers and had extensive engineering experience. The fact that they'd been promoted into management positions didn't cause them to stop being engineers. And it certainly didn't relieve them of their ethical responsibilities as engineers. Indeed, making difficult decisions under ambiguous circumstances is integral to the engineering process. In this sense, the Challenger disaster was unequivocally an engineering failure.